Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Cardona, Director of Climate Policy and Advocacy at Greenbelt Alliance, a regional nonprofit working to educate, advocate, and collaborate to make the Bay Area's lands and communities more resilient to a changing climate. And it's so great to see so many of you tuning in this evening to our second installment of our Future Climate webinar series. In light of the myriad social, economic, and environmental challenges our society is facing, it is now more important than ever to learn from leaders. And so this is a webinar series where every Thursday at five, we are highlighting local climate leaders working in the Bay Area on issues related to making our world more resilient. This week, I'm really excited for us to feature our expert, Dr. Yoon Kim of 427 an affiliate of Moody's, the leading publisher and provider of data, market intelligence and analysis related to physical climate and environmental risk. As managing director of global client services, Yoon provides oversight on all aspects of 427's client engagements. She works closely with investors, corporations, and governments to assess financial and economic exposure to physical climate risks support the integration of climate risk considerations into planning and promote the cross-sectoral dialogue to address physical climate impacts. Super fascinating work. I can't wait to talk with you more about it in just a moment. Um, Yoon has over a decade of experience working with private and public sector entities in the US and globally to assess physical climate risk and identify climate resilience opportunities. She holds a doctorate in development studies from the University of Oxford. And so Yoon, thank you so much for joining us here this evening. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're very excited to hear more about you and your work. So we'll dive right in and I'd love for you to tell us uh, just a little bit more about yourself and the journey that really led to your interest in climate related issues. Yeah, so I grew up in the Chicago area in a northern suburb and then ended up going to school in DC um, as well as in the UK. But when I was headed to college, I knew that I wanted to do work that allowed me to contribute to positive change in some way. And so initially I considered diplomacy um, and hence my interest in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. But then it was during my junior year abroad um, in Cairo that I became interested in international development. And so that led me to pursue my PhD in development studies. Um, and it was pursuant to my PhD that I fell into the climate work. So from a development perspective, climate change is the most important development challenge that we currently face, affecting all aspects of development, ranging from food security to health, to economic opportunities, to migration. Um, and so I fell into the climate work after the PhD and really just fell in love with it at the time, um, found it to be incredibly fascinating and relevant. Uh, and then when I moved to California, I switched focus a little bit. So transitioned from looking at climate issues in the context of development to exploring them more specifically from a Bay Area and California specific focus. Um, and so did some work while I was at the California Ocean Science Trust with a number of the state agencies focused on ocean and coastal issues and uh, their intersect with climate change. And then you now at 427, I um, have, it's kind of the sweet spot where I get to work on both issues that are closer to home as well as more global in nature. Wow, Yoon, thank you so much. It's, it's fascinating to hear more about your, your journey. And in fact, I love that we're having these opportunities to interview um, more of our partners because I get to know even more about you. I didn't realize we're both from Chicago. Uh, so um, <laughs> and we both have a similar uh, trajectory of caring about issues, both globally and locally. My time at the World Bank, I, I wholeheartedly agree with your point about um, the intersection of development and and climate change. So, oh, it's, it's fascinating mm -hmm. to hear um, to hear your journey that brought you to to this moment. So, you now work uh, at Four Twenty Seven, and you know you focus primarily on the private sector actors. So, tell us more, like, what led you to work in this particular space, helping investors and financial systems assess their climate risk and incorporate resilience into decision making. And 
um, just share with us a little bit about what does your day to day look like? Yeah, so in terms of the f my focus, it's ch uh, even in within the climate change space, it's evolved over time. And so when I was working in the development space, I was in DC and working for a USAID contractor. So a, a company that did work for the US Agency for International Development. And my role there was focused on helping USAID and its partners integrate climate risks into their investments. Um, so looking at different types of food security or water infrastructure and other types of programs to think about how one can think about integrating these types of considerations into to development programming. Um, and that I actually moved to California then um, for personal reasons. So just wanted to change and I had family out here. And it was during my time here that I um, started to become more interested in some of the private sector work, recognizing that there, it was at the time an underserved area from the perspective of thinking about physical climate risks. And so when I found 427, I thought it was an interesting organization because there, at the time it was a little bit more focused on local government work in the in the Bay Area, as well as in other parts of the US, um, but had already also started to think about the, the types of issues that were helping to support the private sector better understand and address. And so this was actually always the uh, vision of the founder, Emily Mazzacchiarotti, when she started the company, it was to support the private sector recognizing that gap. And so that is how I ended up um, working on these types of issues. And then in terms of what my day-to-day -day looks like, a good chunk of my time, so 427, for I should provide some more context for those of you who are unfamiliar with the company. We are a data and analytics provider focused primarily on physical risks, physical climate risks. And so what that means is we help to translate the outputs of climate models to inform more climate resilient decision making on the part of economic and financial actors. And the, the work that we do is primarily focused on risk assessment. And so I spend a lot of my days, uh, a lot of my time helping different types of investors, companies, and other types of financial and economic actors better understand what risk exposure looks like, whether they're talking about uh, a portfolio of real estate um, across the United States or a corporate facility footprint or investments in a set of uh, global companies. That's super helpful. Thank you for uh, introducing us more to, to 427 and, and your work there. Has your work always focused then um, at the, at the company on, um, on specifically supporting the private sector? No, so as I mentioned, 427, when I first started working at the company, we did more local government related work. And so there are numerous examples of some of the work that we did supporting, for instance, um, California's climate change assessment, through the California Heat Assessment Tool, which is publicly available and provides insights regarding extreme heat exposure across communities within the state. Um, so that's one example, but we've done a number of other projects helping to assess the exposure to a range of different types of climate hazards across, for instance, uh, Alameda County, as well as some work with other parts of the U.S., including the, the city of Denver, and helping them better understand exposure to extreme heat, um, and the state of Delaware, helping them conduct uh, an assessment focused actually on their workforce and thinking about their, their employees' exposure and what they can do from a worker health and safety perspective. Wow. So it's changed significantly over time. <laughs> right. No, but that's that's definitely. I mean, still the the underpinning, uh, you know, value add is wh where is the data available, bringing that forth into the decision making um, of of all of these actors. That's that's fascinating, and you know, I, mm -hmm. I think it's it speaks to how assessing physical climate and environmental risk is certainly critical for both the public and and the private sector. Um, and, you know, one thing I've been thinking about is the kind of climate risk data that we need to see 
incorporated into policy as, as well as business decisions. This is certainly something Greenbelt is excited to be working on. And, and so in prepping for this conversation, you know, we had talked about how uh, the private sector uh, and investors have the potential to play an important role in incentivizing building local and regional resilience. So could you share more about you know, what trends you are seeing to support this and where progress is being made? Yeah, it's been, um, we're seeing the, there's been a significant increase in interest on the part of different types of private sector actors. And there are a number of different factors that are motivi motivating this. Uh, one of them has to do with the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, which calls for the disclosure of both transition and physical climate risks. Um, but that's been coupled with, for instance, increasing interest on the part of both investors and credit rating agencies, which can be important incentivizers um, and provide important signals about the types of risks that are important to consider. Uh, and this has then also been coupled with regulatory actions, particularly in Europe, so for instance, in France, they require disclosure of physical climate risks on the part of both investors and companies. And we are seeing increasing uptake on the part of, uh, in terms of this type of regulation, and we expect to see that ex extend to more jurisdictions over time in, in, in the near future. And as an example, actually, even here in California, the state requires both CalPERS and CalSTRS to evaluate and disclose material climate risks. And so I expect that these types of requirements will become um, more common in the very near future. Um, and so that's been an important trend. And then coupled with that has been the, as the topic of climate risk becomes uh, more seemingly salient to people, we've seen the conversation shift from being owned by, for instance, by um, sustainability teams and counterparts at our, our clients to being owned by risk teams. Mm -hmm. And that's important because it's seen as more of than a mainstream consideration as opposed to something that is um, a little bit more additional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so like that's been nice to mm, have an extra piece now it's, it's yeah, totally integrated. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And then there are also, we're fine, I find that, so we typically work, I would say, with the leaders in this space from both an investor as well as corporate perspective because it's still early days. Um, but we find that, or I find at least that as our clients start to understand risk, they very quickly get to the point where they realize that understanding risk about their individual assets is not enough. And so that quickly gets them to the point where they become interested then in better understanding both risk and resilience mm -hmm. in terms of the, the communities in which they're invested. Um, like and the one actually system. local example, mm -hmm. yeah, of this is the Bay Area Corporate Climate Resilience Council, which 427 helped to scope um, with Google and a number of other uh, Bay Area anchor companies like Facebook, Wells Fargo, pg and &E, and Genentech. Um, and so that group of companies has been very interested in better understanding their risk exposure, um, but also the intersect then with communities and uh, the interest in exploring potential opportunities for collaboration. And that effort is now being supported by BSR. That is so encouraging to hear. Yeah, I mean, when, when you're talking, it, it, we, we need to hear that systems level view uh, and, and where we can create that impact that is taking a systems level view. So I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that kind of a collaboration to explore that. Um, so we wanted to just remind folks, if you did have uh, questions for you, you can Put them here in the in the Q and A box. I, I see that a few of you are already doing that, so we'll turn to those in in a moment. Um, but I had at least one more uh, question for you, Yun. Um, so, what do you wish that the private sector would surprise us with achieving in the next five years? 
Yeah, I think that, um, you know, as I mentioned, we're still in early days in terms of uptake. There's been a significant progress over the past two to three years. There's really been a sea change, and I expect that this will continue and ramp up. Um, but I think that it will be increasingly important for private sector actor, for this to be an integrated risk across the board, for risks to be priced appropriately, and also to have understanding of climate risks be coupled with um, an understanding of how this topic, how this issue intersects, for instance, with racial justice issues and equity considerations and other types of some of the, the social considerations that fall under the ESG bucket. So we tend to fall squarely in what's considered um, in the environmental bucket, but there are also social and governance factors. And this set of uh, considerations is increasingly uh, prominently on the minds of, I would say, investors and corporates. And it's important to look at climate change as a risk, but not in isolation necessarily mm -hmm. from some of those other factors. Absolutely, super important for that point of view to be integrated. Um, so hopefully that is something we could be surprised with uh, seeing progress on in five years. What do you think you're hopeful for over the next 20 years from the perspective of the private sector? Well, I would say that ideally it's, you know, if climate considerations um, are seamlessly integrated into all economic and financial decision making so that it's um, just a natural part of risk, I think that that would go a long way to incentivizing more climate resilient actions. And so I think we're headed in that direction um, and so hope to see more of that uh, and the uptake just um, be catalyze that uptake in the near future and out to, to over the next few decades. Absolutely. Well, here's here's hoping it can't come too soon, right? <laughs> um, well, thank mm -hmm. you, Yun. I, I think we have a, a few questions coming in the Q&A box here that uh, if we checking our time, do you have an opportunity to turn to those now? Yoon, do you want to take a look and uh, start answering a few of these questions we see here from the audience? Sure. Yeah, so one question that's come in um, is actually has been very much been on um, not only my mind, but also has been a topic of discussion at 427. And that's the question about the um, the fact that um, increased access to the type of data that 427 provides, so climate risk data, there is uh, there have been questions raised about the potential for it to potential uh, to contribute to increased social inequality. Um, and we're this is definitely something that we are attuned to and thinking through both in terms of what we can provide as a company, as well as how we help to frame the data in appropriate ways and also help with messaging. And so along these lines, we hosted a webinar this morning with our parent company Moody's to, that was focused on exploring racial justice and climate change issues, recognizing that there are important intersects there that need to be explored and we're, we are interested in continuing to engage and explore this topic. Fantastic. And actually, uh, we can chat. Uh, you, you've shared with us some recent links and, and reports or blogs related to that. We'll, um, we'll certainly share over via the chat box here. Yes, and then in terms of um, the how local governments and agencies can begin to receive, interpret, and use climate risk data to inform policy. Uh, I would say that in the US, um, and certainly within California, we're very lucky in that we have access to a wealth of pretty excellent climate data that's made available to us by 
way of, for instance, the state of California and their climate change assessment effort, as well as on um, the part of the federal government through NOAA. And so there are important uh, publicly available data sets that can potentially be leveraged. Um, and then there are also initiatives such as the resilience dialogues, which help to connect local jurisdictions that might not have the bandwidth to have dedicated staff focused on this issue, but give them opportunities then to connect with experts who can help them scope and frame the right questions to answer as well as then explore potential data sources and other solutions to the types of issues that they're grappling with. Uh, and then as far as whether or not 427 still works with um, local government, uh, not in the way that we did previously. So we still provide um, information to uh, local governments to help them potentially understand economic exposure to climate risk. And we are just, for instance, kicking off a joint effort with C40 um, in some of their cities along these lines. Uh, and then the last question that's come in so far is about climate data, climate model outputs. Um, and so, yeah, the, we use um, a, a range of different types of data to provide insight into the hazards that we evaluate. And when it comes to climate model outputs, so thinking explicitly about rainfall and temperature projections, we leverage downscaled um, uh, uh, data that's been downscaled by NASA, the NASA NEXT data set. And so we use that at the, and it's, it's the outputs are at 25 kilometers squared. Um, but then we couple that, for instance, when it comes to things like flood risk with data from uh, another data provider um, that provides flood data at a more granular level. So our partner Fathom, based in the UK, provides um, data on flood frequency and severity, for instance, that's at 90 by 90 meters squared, so much more granular. Thank you for answering these excellent questions, kind of ranging the gamut of, uh, of topics. Um, and uh, just to your, to your point of downscaling, I, I do recall that, you know, for certain jurisdictions, that is, that is really the challenge, right, to be able to get access to the downscale. Yeah. So that, because that's the, the level at which we can start to talk about at a neighborhood scale, right, or um, mm -hmm. in thinking about even in more very hyper localized scale um, that many times uh, the data sets that haven't yet been downscaled are not um, are not providing yeah. that level of detail. How, how, you know, how widely accessible is that level of downscaling um, for communities across the United States? Well, if you're talking about downscale data, so the NASA data set is a global data set. And so that's at 25 kilometers squared. That's um, accessible by anybody who chooses to access it. Um, so it does require some expertise to access the data and process it, but it is publicly available data. Um, I know that the state of California also makes a lot of climate data available at a pretty granular level. I can't remember the exact um, granularity of that information, but here we're lucky to have access to that information. And then there are also regional data sets. So for instance, the Bay Area, there have been some pretty granular uh, sea level rise um, studies that have been conducted by, for instance, BCDC and some of the other regional agencies that provide a high level data for this specific region. So I think there are myriad data sources that one can um, potentially leverage, recognizing that there are going to be some regions that have more data that they can use than others. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we are uh, getting near to the end of our time in Zoom. This has been so fascinating and, and great to hear more about you and get to know you. So we really appreciate you being a part of this series in conversation with climate leaders. So before we 
uh, wrap up the event, you know, I'm just curious to hear what being a climate leader means to you. You know, what would you want rising climate leaders to keep in mind? Yeah, for me, an important, probably the most important thing is a commitment to community. And so both the, the local community here in the Bay Area, from my perspective, um, but also the global communities of which I'm a part and have the privilege to serve. And so identifying not only um, where there are opportunities to be helpful, um, but also working to, to collaborate effectively to help affect positive change. Mm. Absolutely. And, you know, this, this is actually, um, I'm just reading there are a few more questions that have come in. And so it's kind of related to that, um, you know, that opportunity to really think about the community and foster that collaboration from your vantage point and in working in uh, 427, you know, where would you recommend then that somebody who's really interested in getting into this work and in particular, the industry that you work in with the private sector and financial systems, what, what could they do to maybe break in uh, into this line of, of work? Yeah, I mean, I would say the landscape is very diverse. So it really depends specifically on what one is interested in doing. Um, but probably the most important thing that you could do is to network actively. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I have gotten my last three jobs. And so I, I'm a very strong proponent of networking and it's a bit of a you know if you're not a natural extrovert it can be a little bit challenging <laughs> at times as so i'm um, more of an introvert than i'm an extrovert but it is highly effective it's also an opportunity it's a great opportunity to learn um, not only about people's experiences but everybody's journey looks a little bit different so it can provide some important aha moments i think as well as highlight things or even roles that you might not have previously considered otherwise. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Excellent advice. I, I couldn't agree more with the networking um, and yeah. you know, just kind of seeing who knows who out there, uh, what their you know, lived and worked experiences are and where you can see those you know, common, common areas of interest and how we can help one another um, all, all want to advance this work. And so um, I, mm -hmm. you know, we're thinking a lot here at Greenbelt Alliance about, you know, what the future of the Bay Area looks like. What does a future climate resilient Bay Area look like? And so I mm -hmm. um, want to sort of ask that to you as well. I mean, um, what, what do you think uh, we see as our, our future vision for a more climate resilient um, Bay Area? I don't think one in the Bay Area can separate climate resilience from resilience more generally. And here, I think a lot of that is inextricably tied to housing and transport. And these are two issues that clearly we struggle with very much. They will be exacerbated by the pandemic. We don't actually know what this region is going to look like once we come out of this. Um, but we can't address climate resilience issues until we address those. So I think for I don't know what the Bay Area will will look like. Um, to be honest, even in a, 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 like a, a few years time, I expect that it will look somewhat different. But um, I, I think that it's going to be critically important for us to address some of these issues um, in conjunction with thinking about things like sea level rise um, and floods and things. Absolutely. They're, they're so inextricably linked and we have to advance those on, on all fronts. Um, so thank you. I appreciate your, your insights on that. And um, thanks to all of you who've asked uh, some additional questions we, we didn't have a chance to get, get to. Um, we are now out of time, Yoon. This has been so great. Thank you so much for joining us today. We so appreciate your time. And for those interested in learning more about Yoon's work, go to 427mt.com. Check out in our chat box a few links that we've shared out with you as well to learn more. And for those who are new to Greenbelt Alliance, we are a nonprofit organization uh, supported by donors like yourself. So you can learn more about our work online and support us by giving today at greenbelt.org donate. 
And please join us next week, uh, Thursday, August 6th at 5 p.m. for our next installment of our Local Climate Leaders Series, where we will be joined by Radhika Fox, CEO of the U.S. Water Alliance. Very excited about that. We hope to see you there and talk more about the future climate. Thanks and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.